Now please get your Bibles out. Open up to the 12th chapter of John. Ushers are going to come. Put your hand up if you don't have a Bible, and we'll put one in your hands. If you need a Bible, you don't own a Bible, consider it our gift to you and take the Bible that you receive and take it home and become a person of the book. John chapter 12. The opening 11 verses of this chapter paint an incredible picture, I believe, of a church. A church pleasing to the Lord. A church that honors the Lord. And so, what I want to do first of all is I want to just read together through these 11 verses with you. And then we'll walk back down through them and see what the Lord will encourage us with and call us to. So would you please, in honor to the Word of God, I know you've been up and down a few times, would you please stand and follow along with me as we read John chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. John 12, 1. Six days before the Passover... Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot One of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial, for the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. You may be seated. A picture, even pre-crucifixion of Jesus, pre-resurrection of Jesus, I think we have a snapshot picture, very early picture here of a church. Let me just give you some initial characteristics that are similar, similar to what we are doing right here this morning, in fact. Number one, they were a group of people who gathered. We are here this morning and we're gathered. And why did they gather? Number two, The reason for their gathering was Jesus. See, Jesus had done something. We'll look more in detail in that a little bit later. But Jesus had done something that motivated them together. together. That's equally true of us. Jesus has done something. Motivates us together. Number three. The individuals that are mentioned in this passage of Scripture... By name, each one of them had their own story of interaction with Jesus or of life change through Jesus. It's true of every believer that's here. You have your own story of how Jesus encountered your life, changed your life. Number four, they were a group of families living in community. Their community was that little village of Bethany, our community is Cornerstone. 
And then number five, the picture of this group of people, of this church painted here, includes victory and vice. There are several noteworthy examples to follow and one example not to follow. See, very similar to what's happening here today to a local assembly of believers. I think what God has given us here is a picture, very early picture of the church. And so I want us to look closely into the story and see the lessons that we can learn, the noteworthy examples that we can follow that will please the Lord. And I'm going to begin by identifying, first of all, two general characteristics about this church, kind of overarching or kind of comprehensive uh, truth realities about this church. And then when we've looked at those two, then we'll get into looking at the individual names mentioned and draw some more principles from the individuals. But first of all, kind of two general overarching truths. Here's the first one. The church is a place of transformed lives. The church is a place of transformed lives. Look at verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So there's context. You read that little statement right there at the end of that sentence. It's giving context. At some point previous, something had happened. Very significant in the life of this little community. The significant event was that Lazarus had died. Death in a very small village becomes a community event. That village, I'm sure the vast majority of that village were a part of Lazarus Death and the days of mourning commonplace to the Jew following that. And four days into those days of mourning, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And then Jesus comes to Bethany. He comes to the village. Jesus, a close friend of Lazarus, comes and what he did there the context the pretext what he did there caused mouths to drop and tears to fall and maybe ladies to faint and men to shout Jesus called into that black tomb and he addressed the rotting corpse of his once friend Lazarus and with his authoritative command he transformed that rotting corpse into Lazarus again alive and well and called him out of the tomb. So let me just ask you this. Would that have been a significant event in that little village? I think we can probably say that was a significant event. And I think we can say this, Lazarus' life was transformed. Does that make sense? Transformed life. Radically transformed life. He went from grave clothes to putting on a dinner robe to have this meal with Jesus. He went from lying on a stone-cold slab in a tomb to sitting and reclining at a table with warm food and close friends. He went from total bondage, mummified, wrapped in burial clothes to the total freedom of new life. Jesus, Jesus, the author of life called across that threshold of death with the voice of authority and his word created life where there had been death. The church 
is to be a place of transformed lives. A place of transformed lives. So what did they do? What did they do when Jesus revisited Bethany? That had happened previous, and now in John chapter 12, Jesus is coming back to this village of Bethany where Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha live, and what do they do? Verse 2, so they gave a dinner for him there. Here's the second general characteristic truth about this church, this group of people. It was a group of people that were honoring Jesus. And what is to be true of all churches is that they are to be places that honor Jesus. It makes perfect sense here, very logical, that they would honor Jesus, doesn't it? He came back to the place where he had called his good friend out of the tomb. And so they wanted to do something to honor him. But listen, let's go from the ancient day to the present day and let the truth be felt deeply here. And the truth is this, as great as the miracle was that Jesus performed that day in Bethany when he said, roll away the stone and then called out to dead, rotting Lazarus, come out. As great of a miracle as that was, it is not as great as the miracle that he has performed for so many of us right here in this church. I just want you to think about that and listen. Don't turn there. Keep your place in John 12, but just listen to what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2.1, Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Verse 4, But God, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Do you see the connection here? Is there anyone in Cornerstone Church that Jesus has raised from the dead? There is a church full of people that Jesus has raised from the dead. And the miracle of our raising is a greater miracle than was performed that day in Bethany when Jesus called Lazarus' physical body out of the grave. And here's why. Because Lazarus died again physically. He was put back into a grave again. But the the new life, the spiritual new life that we receive through the powerful work of Jesus in salvation, it spiritually calls us out of the grave, out from death permanently. We are never going to put on those spiritual grave clothes again, never going to be in a spiritual tomb again. It is an eternal reality for us. Unlike the physical resurrection of Lazarus. So we have certainly as much and much more reason to honor Jesus when we come together for what he has done for us. A church is to be a place that honors Jesus, a place of transformed lives that live those lives to honor Jesus. They had one example, one living example. We have hundreds every Sunday morning. You see, what Jesus has been doing over the last 2,000 years, what Jesus has been doing among our body here, this church, is he's been canceling the reservations for those who are bound for hell, and he has 
booked a suite in heaven. I just want to run with that for fun for a moment and make a comparison here. Here's what's going to be true if you're a follower of Jesus about the suite that Jesus has booked for you in heaven. First of all, you're not going to show up and find out that your room has been given to someone else. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. And in that place, the sun is always going to be shining, the S-O-N. But it's not going to be near as hot as the other place that you could have went to. You're not going to get burnt laying poolside in heaven, outside your suite. You would have gotten fried in the other location. You're going to have an out-of-this-world buffet table in heaven. And what passes through your lips is not going to remain on your hips. Hallelujah. All of your body parts are going to work. Some of you appreciate that more than others. All of your friends are going to be nice. That's, that's a pretty, we could just dwell on that one for a minute, right? All of your friends are going to be nice. And finally, none of it is going to go on your credit card. It's going to all go on the master's card. That's what is coming for us. The miracle that Jesus has done taking us from spiritual death to spiritual life an eternal reality guaranteed and he hasn't just done that but he's going to do literally in addition to that the very same thing he did for Lazarus physically he's going to call us physically out of the grave and we're going to walk away from that grave forever and never be around it again. In fact, this thought came to me. It's not a new idea, but just the way the thought came to me was new to me is this. You know what there isn't going to be in heaven? There's going to be no cemeteries in heaven. That's a pretty cool reality, isn't it? No cemeteries in heaven. So, the town of Bethany had a very good reason to live for the honor of Jesus, to have a gathering in honoring the Lord Jesus. We have a greater reason. Every time we gather, whether it be here in our large Sunday morning gatherings or our life groups or our Bible studies or our men's and women's events, we have far greater reason together in honor to the Lord Jesus Christ who has redeemed us and given us new life, spiritual life, and one day eternal physical life. Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, the offer is extended to you. It's a free gift purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. His willing sacrificial death on the cross as the sinless Son of God taking upon the sins of those who would be His, paying their penalty so that all those that the Father gives Him would be redeemed, eternally redeemed, spiritually made alive and one day physically called out of the grave forever. It is a gift of grace purchased by the all-sufficient work of Jesus. And it is there for you if you will put your faith in Him, if you will trust in Him. 
It's for you. What did Lazarus and his family do? We spoke generally about the church being a place of transformed lives and a place that honors Jesus, but what specifically did they do to prepare for Jesus? How did that picture there of the early church, how did they honor Jesus? Let's look specific. Let's go from general you know, truth, kind of comprehensive truth statements now to the specifics by looking at the individuals that are mentioned in this text and learn a lesson from each one of them. What we know that they did is that they gathered and their gathering was an honor. It was an honor to Jesus. You know, Jesus wants those. You gathering here this morning because of who Jesus is and what he says, that's honor to him. He's told you to do this. He's told us in his word, don't forsake this. Don't forsake the gathering together. He knows that we need community. He called us a body because he wanted to emphasize that we are in need of one another. We are members of one body dependent on one another. We are not islands in of ourselves, just me and Jesus or you and Jesus. We're a part of a body. We are to experience the Lord together as a community. So there is an honor that comes to gathering. And then they gave. They didn't just gather, they gave. They honored Jesus by giving. They gave because Jesus had given. He had given new life to Lazarus. And so they gathered together and had a meal. They gave, they served in honor to Jesus. So here's the question. How can we be a trans a church of transformed lives that honors Jesus by our gathering and our giving? How can we do that? If we look at these individuals, I think John 12 answers how we can do that. First of all, this church was a place of gifted service. Look at Verse 2 of John 12. The first two words. Martha did what? Say it again, church. Martha. Here's the first person mentioned by name. It's Martha. And what it says, one word of description, Martha served. You know, Martha is mentioned a few times in the Gospels. Keep your finger there in John chapter 12, and I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1. We'll come right back in a moment. But I want to show you another passage in which Martha is mentioned. And it's important, I think, to do this here because we get a a fuller picture of who Martha is and the growth or the development that took place in Martha's life. So Luke chapter 10. Let me give you the setup. To this account, Jesus is at Martha's house, and Martha's preparing a meal, and she's busy about the duties of preparing a meal. There's a lot of people that have come to see Jesus, and there's Mary, her sister Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, drinking in every word. And the more Martha works, the hotter Martha gets. Until finally, she has had enough, and she comes into the room where everyone is gathered, and there in front of all the guests, she says openly to Jesus, Luke chapter 10, look at verse 40, the second half, beginning at the second half of verse 40. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion 
which will not be taken away from her. So let's just explore this picture of Martha and compare it to the picture of Martha in John chapter 12. Here, Martha, with an attitude of worry and anxiety, a troubled attitude, she is serving. Martha, you are anxious and troubled, Jesus said. She is serving in anxiety and trouble. And it's not just anxiety and trouble because Martha or Mary, her sister, is sitting there doing nothing. That's part of it, but look at what Jesus says. Martha, you are anxious and troubled about what? Many things. You have an anxious and troubled heart, attitude, the MO of your life. You're anxious and you're troubled in your serving. You're fretting and you're brewing over what needs to be done and over who is not doing what they need to be doing in your viewpoint. You are anxious and troubled, Martha. But in John chapter 12, we don't get that picture of Martha, do we? We just have the statement that Martha served. I believe what God is telling us here is that Martha, who had complained in the past, who had served in the past out of the motivation and the attitude of anxiety and worry, she is no longer serving like that. She's still serving. It's a key characteristic of her life, her personality, her makeup, but it's a sanctified process now in her. She is no longer serving out of worry. She's serving out of worship. She is a not a worried servant. She's a worshiping servant. The motivation of her service is her love for the Lord Jesus Christ for what he had done for them. Likewise, let's make the connection now, ancient day to present day. We are being told here, given a picture here of how we are to serve Jesus in the church. Go to 1 Peter, keep your finger in John 12. Go to 1 Peter 4, verse 10. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. We are to use the spiritual gifts that we have received in salvation. We are to use those spiritual gifts in service to the Lord as we serve one another out of a heart of worship for him. Not a heart of worry or anxiety, but a heart of worship. But just look at 1 Peter 4.10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Just, Just look at that closely for a minute. As each has received a gift... Paul is say, or Peter is saying to a church, he's writing this to a group of believers, and he's saying, every one of you has received a gift, a spiritual gift. That's true. That's the teaching of Scripture. If you are saved, you are in that salvation. You were given at least one spiritual gift, some many. You've received that freely from the Lord. So here's what you're to do. You're to use it to serve one another. And in your service, you're to do it as, quote, good stewards. Not worried, anxious stewards. You're to do it as good stewards, knowing this, you are actually stewarding the grace of God that was given to you in salvation when you were given that gift or those gifts 
You have the grace of God. You actually become not a reservoir. You become a river. You become a dispenser of the very grace of God, that incredible life-transforming thing called the grace of God. We actually have the privilege of using that, sharing the grace of God, stewarding it as we serve one another. So I think the new and improved, the sanctified Martha is a picture of this. She's a picture of someone that is using, a follower of Jesus that is using their gift in a sanctified way to serve others, thereby honoring Jesus. So here we've got Martha setting an example of gifted service. The church is a place of gifted service, specifically. Number two, the church is a place of a powerful witness. Let's look at the next individual identified. Verse two again. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Let me just state that again. Look at Lazarus. Lazarus was one of those reclining with Jesus at table. And everybody in the church says, I want to volunteer for Lazarus' duty. I want to kick back table side with Jesus. Unfortunately, quote, designated eater is not one of the spiritual gifts. Look at verses 9 to 11. Let's zero in on what the example of Lazarus is teaching us about how the church, how this group right here in John 12 and how today the church honors Jesus. John 12, verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, verse 11. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Let's read that again. Because of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away from Judaism, from that religion, and they were believing in Jesus. So what is Lazarus? Lazarus is a witness. He's a powerful witness, an incredibly powerful witness whose life is causing many to come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lazarus was a living, breathing, walking, talking, 3D picture of the power of Jesus Christ to transform life. We say, yeah, obviously, he was in the grave, dead four days, now he is alive. The difference was quite striking, but what about Believers, we are called from death to spiritual life. We should look different. We should look different. The world should look at us and see, though they can't see it externally, that the attitude of our life, the perspective of our life, the focus of our life, the desire of our life, the things that motivate our life, they should be radically different than what they were prior to salvation. They have to be. We were dead then and didn't understand spiritual reality and the hope that's coming, but now we're alive. It's completely different. And it should look different in the way that we live our life so that it is noticeable to the world. See, what does Jesus want? 
of believers who were dead in sin and have been given brand new life freely through his grace. Here's what he wants. He wants us to be a living, breathing, walking, talking, 3D picture of the power of Jesus to change lives. That's what he wants. That's what will honor him. Living transformed lives as people see the difference that Jesus has made in us and then sharing the truth of Jesus with our lips, our lives and our lips. So I see two things here in Lazarus' example of a powerful witness. We're to live in the power of Jesus so that people will notice a radical difference. And secondly, how do we do that? We do it like Lazarus did it. Here's what we know about Lazarus. Let me fill in a little more information on the story. We know that Lazarus was a, quote, close friend of Jesus. Jesus, when he was there in Jerusalem, was told that Lazarus was ill. Here's the message that came to him. The one you love is ill. The one you love. Jesus and Lazarus were close. When he got to Bethany outside of the tomb of his close friend, Scripture says, gives us a little window into the compassion and the intimacy of Jesus. With Lazarus says that Jesus wept. And what's happening here in John 12, Jesus is reclining at the table Lazarus is reclining at the table with Jesus. What's the picture here? The picture is a closeness to Jesus. It's an intimacy with a close friend. That's the picture. And what an incredible principle is locked into that about how to live a powerfully transformed life. And it goes like this. The closer you live in relationship to Jesus, the more transformed your life is going to be. It's from his presence that we are changed. It's as we see him more that we are changed. It's as we see with unveiled faces and behold the glory of Jesus that we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next, more and more like him as the Spirit of God uses that vision, that growing vision of the glory of Jesus in us to make us more like Jesus. You see, it's closeness to Jesus out of which flows the power of a transformed life. So here we have in Lazarus the example of a powerful witness. And then number three, specifically with another character in the story in verse three, the church is a place of passionate worship. Look at verse three. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Third character is Mary. And Mary takes her bottle of ointment, valued I know this sounds shocking, valued at a year's wage. Whatever the average year's wage here, just put a dollar figure on that, a bottle of ointment, valued at a year's wage. And she uses it, at least 
a portion of it. She uses it to lavish her worship on Jesus. That's what she's doing here. She took her most expensive possession and she poured it on Jesus' feet. Just Let me just say what it's not, what she's not doing to try to emphasize it. She is not taking a significant amount of money and donating it to missions here. Is that bad to do? No, it's great to do. I love missions. I'm not against missions. I just want to see what Mary's doing here. She's not taking and giving a large sum of money towards some outreach and evangelistic event. She is taking an exorbitantly expensive gift and she's pouring it on dusty feet. That's something in the heart that's being identified here. And what's being identified is a heart that treasures Jesus above all else. That it's not a waste to take something extravagantly valuable, physically valuable like that and pour it on the feet of the Lord of all the universe. It's actually an act of passionate worship that is pleasing to the Lord, that is honorable to the Lord. True worship is not what I am gaining from the experience and not even what others are gaining from my expression of worship. True worship is this. It steps out of the practical and into the passionate and it shows Jesus that you love him with everything that you have. Let me say that again. True worship steps out of the practical and into the passionate and it shows that you love him with everything that you have. That nothing in this world compares to him that he is the treasure passionate worship that includes you voicing your songs in praise yes I encourage you do that passionately don't do it without feeling don't just do it if you really like the song. Remember, it's not. It's for him. It's for him. Don't do it if you just sing perfectly on key. It's for him. He looks at the heart. He wants a heart of passion poured out to him. But it doesn't just mean your musical praise. It means you living a life that treasures him above all else. So what do we have in Mary? In Mary, we have this example of passionate worship. So what I'm saying in these three individual characters, what I'm saying is a church of transformed lives that honors Jesus by gathering and giving, that kind of a church, that kind of a church that really honors Jesus like that is a church with workers who are using their giftings as an overflow of their love for Jesus. And secondly, it's a church of witnesses who are living radically transformed lives before others as they live out an intimate relationship with Jesus. And it's the church of worshipers who lavish their love on Jesus by passionate acts of worship. The church needs to be about all three of those. And I don't mean this. Don't misunderstand me. I don't mean that you kind of find out which one of those you are. You're probably more wired toward one than the other, more naturally. But what I'm saying is this, 
All believers are to be all three. All believers are to be all three. We are to be workers using our giftings, serving him in honor. We're to be witnesses with radically transformed. Does, it, does he just want that for a few people, living radically transformed lives that tell others about him? Is that the plan? No, it's all of our responsibilities. And then he wants worshipers who are passionate who treasure him more than anything else in their life dictates that. So we've got three individuals that give us three great examples of how we can be a place that gathers and that gives in a way that honors him. And then we have Judas, verses 4 to 7. I'll close with this. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Judas didn't honor Jesus by pointing out what he thought was a waste of a gift. Here's what Judas did. He found something to complain about. And he voiced that publicly. That is an honoring to Jesus. We shouldn't do that. If you are a part of a church, every church has things to complain about. Absolutely, Cornerstone has things to complain about. But the more that a church has to complain about, the less the complainer should be because that church really needs help. They don't need the negative. They need the positive. They need the workers and the witnesses and the worshipers to do in love for Jesus what they're called to do. Let's be a church like this. Each one of us learning to do all three of those exemplary things and Jesus will be honored. Jesus will be honored. Would you please stand? So Lord... I ask that you would, as only you and your spirit can do, you would take and apply that truth with your omniscient insight into each one of our lives. Where we need to engage with that truth in the sanctifying process that you're doing, all those here that are believers. Lord, and for those that are not, I pray that you would open eyes to see. You would bring from spiritual death souls to spiritual life, granting them faith and repentance so that they run, Jesus, to you in trust and become a part of the transformed lives that are living for your honor as they gather and they give. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.